And if you said you were from Hawaii, that sold. You almost didn't have to do anything. And so we started traveling around the world. And, and when we came home, people wanted shows. We actually had to decide, we got to get off stage. You cannot be producer, director, business manager, choreographer, which is what we did all. And oh, God, try to do the books. Hello. <laughs> I just had them open their kimonos to add a little more to the show. And what were the skaters wearing? The skaters wore clothes, but the three girls that stood there <laughs> on oh, the ice, they I were the see. nudes on ice. <laughs> that was my hook. Every show needs a hook, you know. Yeah, because you're a marketer, too. Yes. <laughs> was there a time you considered getting out because maybe the risk was too high or the, you know, the, the cost was too high in some way? No, I've never felt that way. Uh, I've always been very optimistic about this business, that uh, people want to be entertained. They want to see live, live concerts. They want to go out and be there and experience that music firsthand. The world of bright lights and big stages holds a certain allure, but only a few carve out a successful business in the grueling entertainment world. Meet three of Hawaii's showbiz masterminds next on Long Story Short. One-on-one -on -one engaging conversations with some of Hawaii's most intriguing people. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox. Aloha my kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Show business can be fun, exciting, and profitable, but there are no guarantees. Yet, Polynesian Entertainment Company co-owner Shaw Thompson, nightclub owner Jack Sion, and the late radio DJ turned concert promoter Tom Moffat excelled in this risky industry. These three people are very different from each other. In common, they all trusted their artistic tastes and business instincts to entertain Hawaii for decades. First, we turn to our 2008 conversation with Shaw Thompson. In the early 70s, she was a 19-year-old hula dancer traveling the world for performances when she was suddenly put in charge of a popular Polynesian dance group. Shaw Thompson and her husband Jack soon founded Tihati Productions, now one of the largest and longest running entertainment companies in Hawaii. I was with the, the original Puka Puka Otea group that Elaine Frisbee from, from Rarotonga ran, and we were the only one in the state to do Polynesian everything. And then when she was leaving, I was her lead dancer, and she simply said, here, take it and run. And at 19, excuse me, I knew nothing about business. Um, and so, you know, we, when I married my husband, and I was working in medical records at Queen's Medical Center, and he was working in reservations at Hawaiian Airlines, and, and um, people started calling us. And I'm telling you, we, it was so successful because tourism at the time was the thing, and everybody wanted a show. What, what year was that? What general, what general decade? 1969, mm -hmm. 70. And if you said you were from Hawaii, that soul. You almost didn't have to do anything. And so we started traveling around the world. And, and when we came home, people wanted shows. We actually had to decide, we got to get off stage. You cannot be producer, director, business manager, choreographer, which is what we did all. And oh, God, try to do the books. Hello. <laughs> you dance? What did your husband do? He was the MC. Yeah. And he didn't, his very first um, uh, thing to do was he came to Canada when I was with the World's Fair and I was a dancer and he was one of the few Polynesians who could speak English. So when our MC got sick, he said, give it to Thompson. And he said, I'm not an entertainer, you know, and, and uh, in fact, just before we left, he said, I'm part Samoan. Surely I can learn the knife dance. I always thought he was too <laughs> handsome to be a knife dancer. He didn't look as <laughs> wild and savagery, but he learned it and um, became a knife dancer, terrible knife dancer in the beginning. Can't hold a candle next to my son, who's a, who's a, who's a world holder, a title holder. Uh, but that's how we started. We, we had to get off stage and, and get a good attorney, get a great uh, CPA, and we started, we, we gave up our careers to run the business. Well, you were singled out to be the one to take over the dancing troupe. Yes. Why? You know, I wonder if because I was always so shucks, I was always vocal. I always had an opinion, I wonder. And, and many of the Polynesian girls were more um, reserved. They didn't, they didn't always, I always had the plan. 
I always had the plan. And it was a good plan? It was a good plan. I think survival mode, always in a survival mode, you know. And, and I think that's what my children detect. Like, Mom, oh, you know, I always plan for tomorrow and I'll save, you know, the rainy day is coming and, and, and always dress well if you get into an accident and make sure you have <laughs> clean underwear. And, and, you know, the house must be clean. The house must be clean. Visitors would come, they'll judge us. Mm -hmm. I always felt like I was being judged, always. People started taking us seriously when we, when we would sit on business boards or when we contributed in a, in a business a fashion, you know, but yeah, I mean, you're Polynesian, surely you can't be too smart, and entertainment heavens, you must fool around, and you must do drugs. Well, we did neither, and, and, and it paid off. It paid off for us. I sense you're a good negotiator. I'm trying to figure <laughs> out what your style is. It's the Pake blood, <laughs> Leslie. It's the Chinese blood. And the funny thing about it is, in entertainment, they will say, oh, come and put on a show, or oh, come and sing and dance for us, and you can eat all you want, and you can drink. I don't drink. Um, I'm really thin. I don't eat that much. I need something else. And money was the thing I needed. And but we had to earn it. We had to earn it. They didn't take us seriously, you know. I know you brought in some major acts yes. and developed major talent. I think we're known as a Polynesian review, and I don't know that many people know that Tihati Productions has a vast department that brings in contemporary acts, um, like we brought in Lionel Richie and Cindy Lauper, and we also do thematic parties. You know, we'll we'll prepare a whole Raiders of the Lost Ark or um, Aloha in a Volcano. So we do many things, but I think they still think of me as the hula girl. I mean, maybe because they'll all say, "Oh, you know, you." You run that halal, and I say, no, I'm not a kumu. I, I don't have a halal, but Tihati Productions, they think of as, as a Polynesian review. You've had to really strike a balance between Polynesian mm. authenticity mm -hmm. and entertainment. H how have you worked that out? I decided early on not to educate them, rather to entertain them, but to not sell myself and not give them what is real. Any Tihati review uh, that you see will have real flowers, we'll use real tea leaf skirts, we do authentic numbers and sing it in the native tongues, you know, Tahitian, Samoan, Fijian, um, and, and a lot of my instructors are from those islands, uh, Hawaiian. Um, so I never felt that uh, tourism was a threat to me. In fact, um, when some people might have thought, oh, that's a sellout, she's worked in Waikiki for 35 years, you know, why isn't she with us? I will say, well, Tourism Dollar sent all my kids to college, and I never felt that I wasn't doing exactly what is me. You know, I believe God gave me a gift in my roots and my heritage, and I share it. And lucky for me, uh, tourism is Hawaii's number one industry, and they'll always need the hula girl and the steel guitar and the fire knife dancer. And so I think I'm here to stay. With clear vision, quick reflexes, and a tenacious attitude, Shaw Thompson and her husband Jack built a respected, long-running entertainment business. Our next showbiz mastermind is also a longtime entrepreneur. Jack Sion first gained notoriety in the 60s with live shows that were new to Honolulu at the time, nude entertainers, and bottomless waitstaff. He was fired up to put on his own dance productions after seeing what he called a lousy show at the old Forbidden City nightclub in Kaka'ako. Here from our conversation in 2014, Jack Sayon remembers talking to the Forbidden City's manager about organizing his first shows there. I just told him how bad his show was. He said, you want to do a show for me? I said, yeah, I'll do a show for you. I have nothing to do. He said, how much is it going to cost? I said, I'll do a show for you for nothing. I just need something to do. So I did a show at the Forbidden City. And um, I did two shows that made a lot of money. And then I did an ice show. First time we had an ice show at the Forbidden City. I called it Nudes on Ice. So you put in an ice skating rink? Yeah. it was. A, about twice the size of this table, <laughs> portable, and two skater friends of mine from the mainland. I brought them over and said, come and skate a paid vacation, two weeks. So they came over, and I had the Japanese girls then, and I 
used the Micho girls, and I talked three of the Japanese girls into going topless. I just had them open their kimonos to add a little more to the show. And what were the skaters wearing? The skaters wore clothes, but the three girls that stood there <laughs> on oh, the ice, there were the see. nudes on ice. <laughs> that was my hook. Every show needs a hook, you know. Yeah, because you're a marketer, too. Yes. <laughs> So that so you, now you're really kind of dealing in a different kind of uh, venue. Right, and there were no nightclubs having any nudity. It was against the law. And when did you, you know, you already lied about your age, but now, now you're talking about breaking the law. Well, there were no laws. Uh, Hawaiian dancers worked topless in King Kao Throughout Kao. history. <laughs> right. And so what was the law? What was the, what was the big deal? So the next show I did was a complete nude show. I brought burlesque in. It wasn't nude. It was just topless. The girls then had to wear pasties and mm -hmm. silk bras. But it eventually evolved. And every time we would do that, they would come and arrest me. And You're saying this like this is, you know, just part of doing business, but, I mean, you, and what was the charge? Was it lewdness, open lewdness? Lewd and lascivious conduct. Well, how did you feel about that? Well, they'd arrest me, and I'd say, excuse me, can I go to the restroom? And I'd run in my office, and I'd call the TV and the newspaper, and I'd stay there until they all got to the So club. you're actually enjoying this. Oh, loving it. And the next morning, it was in the papers, and it was on TV. Was that part of being a showman? Yes, and business increased. People would see that. Oh, look at arrested, nude. We got to go see that at <laughs> Forbidden City. And how did your new wife think about this? Well, <laughs> she didn't particularly like it, but it was making lots of money. And so we opened that club, then we opened another one. I ended up with 12 bars here. And, and how many arrests? Oh, gosh, I was arrested so many times, but not once conviction. Because, as you said, the laws hadn't caught up with this business activity. Right. We went topless, then we went bottomless, and then we went totally nude. We used to have a uh, businessman's lunch at the dunes. Back when three martinis were tax deductible, right? Right. And it was all businessmen. and. Um, the show was a striptease show. And the secretary said, we're so tired of coming with our boss. Why don't you put a naked man on stage for us? And I just happened to say, well, why don't you get me a reservation for 50 ladies and I'll have a naked man for you. That's how it started. And how many did you get a reservation for 50? Oh, gosh. They called about two weeks later and they said, we have you're 50, you're going to have a naked man? I said, yes. Well, by the time the two weeks came, they had 200 reservations. That filled up my room. <laughs> they kept out my men customers. The ladies took all the seats. And w did you have your naked waiter in no, line? I no, I didn't have how do, you go, how do you hire a naked waiter? In those days, this was now 1973, and there were no such a thing as Chippendales and men strippers. But I had a beach house in Haleiwa that I was renting to five surfers. And they were behind on their rent. So I called them and said, you guys got to pay the rent or you got to come in and do me a favor. They said, what is it? I said, well, you got to come to the dunes Friday and you got to drop your pants on stage. Oh, hell yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> Those women stayed all day. We had the biggest bar business I ever did that afternoon. They all drank, drank, and the surfers were Paraded. Paraded without their pants. So when I saw that, I thought, oh, this is a gold mine. So in a week's time, I told the gals, I said, we're going to have waiters every day. Instead of waitresses. Instead of waitresses. Because the women were the ones who were paying more money. Yes, and so. As clients. That's how it happened. I mean, people keep coming back. Oh, Un unreal. 400 lunches Monday through Friday. Among all of this, I just sense that the, your guiding force is money and sh 
showbiz, but you weren't really into the, the flesh stuff of it all? No, nightclub business is not an easy business, but I stayed the straight line and um, did it as a business. I don't drink, I never did drink. And so I always said, people want to buy me a drink. I said, you know, I'm in the business to sell this. I don't drink it. Jack Sion is a showbiz mastermind who went with his gut. He knew what he liked, saw what worked, and gave people what they wanted. So did our next guest. Much has been said about the late Tom Moffat's career, first as a pioneering rock and roll radio DJ who introduced Hawaii to Elvis Presley. Then as a promoter of big name concerts, bringing everyone from the Eagles to Bruno Mars to the islands. But let's not forget Tom Moffat's work with local acts, especially during the Hawaiian music renaissance in the 1970s. In our 2011 conversation, he recounts his work with Keola and Kapono Beamer on a recording that still strikes a chord here at home and beyond. I had just left radio. I'd finally decided that uh, I'd gone through a couple of owners at Cape Boy and a third one was coming in, and I decided it was time to take a hiatus from radio, so I, I started my own record company. And in the door walked Capono Beamer one day and said that they weren't happy with wherever they were in recording. And so I got the two of them in and uh, talked to them about it, and I said, why don't you guys go out and write? And uh, let's do a record together, an album. So uh, two or three, I gave him some seed money to go, go out and write. And uh, Keola called me and said, I think I've got a song. And he was living up at Aleva Heights, I'll never forget it. And I went up to Aleva Heights to hear this song. It was just when it was getting dusk and that time of the evening when it was getting dark and the lights were coming on and he played for me, Honolulu City Lights. And I knew we had something. So that was my first recording endeavor really on my own. And we came out with Honolulu City Lights, got Teddy Rendazzo to help with the arrangements. And, and for decades, I believe that was the highest selling local album of all time. Is it still? Uh, I don't know what uh, is around. <laughs> and I think Kelly e. Reichel might have had a, a, oh, a yes, really yes. big seller. But uh, not that long ago, a few years back, uh, uh, I think it was the Star Bullet and the Advertiser and Honolulu Magazine came out with a list of the the best, the best albums, not best selling, just the best albums, Hawaii albums of all time. And number one was Honolulu City Lights. That was a thrill. It's still my favorite. <laughs> I still love that song. Me too. Actually, that came out when I was seeing a lot of friends off to college at the airport. Yeah. So it was, and it was always playing in the airport then, and they're uh -huh. always crying. And, and those are the days where you, People, you didn't have to, there, were no, there was no security. Yes. You went to the gate to see people You could go off. to the gate with Lay's, yeah. And, and local style, you didn't bring just Lay's, you brought bentos and yes. food and everybody uh -huh. had luau's and that song was just playing oh, almost yeah. continuously. And if it wasn't, somebody was asking. <laughs> yeah. So that's a, I mean, that's a, such a, a cultural memory uh -huh. in Hawaii. That was your first ever recorded yes. song. Yeah, and well, I've done some singles and so forth. And once I put out an album, a trumpet album, but uh, that was about other people involved. But this is the first one I did on my own, was Honolulu City Lights. At the same time, uh, I had a girl that worked for me just as I was leaving Cape Boy, and she said, you gotta go out and see this group in Aina Haina. Randy Borden? No. No, okay, who? Country Comfort. Country Comfort. Yeah. Playing at the, at the old Stuy. Uh, M's Ranch House? No, this is at the Stuy. Stuy. It wasn't Aina Haina, it was beyond Aina Haina, at the Stuy. At New, that's right. Yeah, and I heard these guys, and I went out and, and saw what was happening with the audience, and what they had uh, going for them. And so I finished off an album that, uh, this is just before Honolulu City Lights that my partner Irv Paninski had started. And I finished off the album and uh, we put it out together. Then after that, I left out on my own. But uh, I was, Country Comfort was one of my favorite albums. I also did an album by the Surfers at that time called Shells, which I still think is one of the best Hawaiian albums ever, ever produced. Who are the local artists that you um, most enjoyed working with and had the, the most success with? Well, the, Roy the Royal Drifters were one of the first local groups. Dick Jensen, Robin Luke, uh, Ronnie Diamond. They were all big singers in, uh, in the 50s and early 60s. And uh, we, we used them as often as possible on the show of stars at the Civic Auditorium and uh, whenever we could at the, at the new arena. I remember the first time that the Rolling Stones came to town, uh, 
I put Dick Jensen on as the opening, Lance Curtis as the opening group, opening performer. Lance Curtis. And he danced like Michael Jackson. This is before Michael Jackson. He could dance. You know, all of these enterprises, these artistic enterprises mm -hmm. are, and creative enterprises, to, to really be stable and, and to make a go of them, you have to be good at money, you have to be good at restraint, and you have to be good at planning. And uh -huh. did, you, did you have that all along, or did you have to learn that the hard way? I'm still learning. <laughs> still learning. But I got good accountants around me. And, yeah. and you're not, by nature, prone to take unreasonable risk? No. Uh, we put quite a bit of money into some of the recording projects, but I believed in them, and it, it turned out okay. Uh, opening Outrigger Main Showroom was was kind of a gamble. It was a, a room that was sitting there. It was a convention room that they never used. And Tommy Sands had come to Hawaii and uh, was looking for a place to work, and so we opened that showroom, and it's been going ever since. After Tommy, I kind of drifted off, but. Uh, and another time when the Beamers got going with Honolulu City Lights, uh, there's another room that was sitting empty, which we opened as the Reef Showroom, or the uh, at the Reef Hotel, the Ocean Showroom at the Reef Hotel. That's what we called it. And they put uh, the Beamers in there. That was kind of a gamble at the time, but I felt you know this record was happening, so we opened the showroom with uh, Keolan Capono Beamer and Andy Bumatai as the opening comedian. It was very successful. Was there a time you considered getting out because maybe the risk was too high or the you know, the, the cost was too high in some way. No, I've never felt that way. Uh, I've always had been very optimistic about this business, that uh, people want to be entertained, they want to see live, live concerts, they want to go out and be there and experience that music firsthand. The concert promoter, the nightclub entrepreneur, and the Polynesian Entertainment Company co-owner, three masterminds in showbiz who trusted their tastes and instincts to entertain the islands. After months of declining health, Tom Moffat left us in 2016. What an honor to revisit his tremendous career. And we thank Jack Sion and Shaw Thompson for their savvy business stories. Mahalo to you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Aloha Nui. You learned that from Kalihi. Somebody puts you down and, eh, you know, I could do something better than they could. I knew I could. I don't know how this is going to sound, but what was important is you got to know how to beef, quite you frankly. You can beef. <laughs> you can beef. Yeah, man. So elegant. Yeah, man. <laughs> Or at least I used to a lot. Um, and you know, when you come from a large family, nobody wants to beef with you, because in the housing, families fight families. I mean, I know it sounds uh, imbecilical, but we did. I mean, that was, Did you, you know, beef boys, too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, most of the boys didn't want to take me on, though. I had brothers, big brothers. I mean, you were just a kid, playing in, at nightclubs. Until, what, what time did you go to sleep? Well, I changed my age. I was, I was 20 then, everybody thought, because uh, I had a mustache at 14. I didn't look like a high school student. And um, I was making $75 a week. That's Just good money in 19. <laughs> and how did you keep up with school when you were actually working in the city? Yeah, well, I didn't keep up with school. That was the sad part. I remember one day a teacher said to me, Jackie Tooney, you're going to be a bum. You're going to be a bum if you don't learn algebra and English. And I said, get out of my face, honey. I make 75 bucks a week. What are you making? School teachers in those made $35 a week. Ouch. Hey, I introduced to them, Elvis Presley. The place went crazy. It was so exciting. Really high decibels. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, there he was, just a, a microphone and a simple sound system. But he held that audience, and... <laughs> and when had you met him before that? Well, the day before, uh, Ron and I, Ron Jacobs and I, Ron figured this one out, do something different. And we kind of, we'd met the Colonel, and we kind of hit it, there might be something like this in the works. And uh, Don Tyler was one of our guys at Cape Boy, and we dressed him up to look like Elvis. Ron had this convertible, uh, a Ford convertible, hard top convertible, top went down. And uh, got a fellow who looked like Colonel Parker and Ron driving. And we had it all planned. I'm on the radio. From the moment Elvis arrived, I'm on the radio playing nothing but Elvis records. 
and I did this all morning into the afternoon. So I, I kind of planned it. Well, it's, it, 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 we, we, we understand that Elvis is heading for Kailua. So people would be out in the streets waiting for, looking for Elvis and drive down the streets and people are screaming and we did this different neighborhoods. Did you get any uh, fallout from it? Well, we got back to the studio. By then I'd played Elvis for six straight hours, at least. It was mid-afternoon and uh, we're patting ourselves in the back and we get the message from our news guy that uh, Colonel Parker wants to see you guys upstairs or downstairs immediately. Dun, 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 dun. Oh. And we looked at each other, we want to escape. So we went downstairs and there's guards at the elevator. We went down one floor and they took us into uh, Colonel Parker's suite. Colonel said, uh, we didn't know what to expect. Colonel said, boys, that was a pretty good promotion you did. Oh my gosh. Oh, and here's Elvis, and walked Elvis. That's the first time I'd met Elvis. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org.